The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. Book Two North or Be Eaten. Chapter 43 Three Days in Darkness. Hard as it was to believe, there was something positive about being stuck in the box for three long days. Janner had plenty of time to think back on what he had done to get there and what he would do when he got out. He lay in the coffin and went over it again and again, second-guessing himself, preparing his nerves for the next stage of the plan, wondering if Moberg suspected anything. Finding the Ridge Runner had been easy enough. He was always zipping here and there, climbing chains, leaping from coal pile to gearbox to table, a sort of maintenance manager for the maintenance managers. When Mobrick came near during the second shift, Janner had called his name. What do you want? The Ridge Runner asked. I need a favor, Janner said. Do you have any fruit? And with great satisfaction, Janner said, yes. What do you mean? Mobrick's eyes narrowed. Where did you get fruit? None of your business. Maybe I had it with me when I got here. Maybe I know things about this factory that you don't. Maybe there's a fruit tree atop the building that drops apples down the gutter and into my pockets. Moberg looked at the ceiling, then raised an eyebrow at Janner. You're being funny. You're trying to be funny. Nope, Janner said, and he produced an apple from his pocket. Moberg's eyes grew as wide as the apple itself. The little creature snatched it away, then whacked Janner in the head. That's for trying to be funny with me. I don't know where you got the apple, but you can be sure I'll report this to the overseer. Now get back to work. He turned to go. But I still need a favor, Janner said. Moberg stopped. What? I need a favor. Do you have more fruit? Moberg asked, this time less sure of himself. Yes, I have more fruit, but it's hidden away. If you do the favor, I'll tell you where it is. Two more apples. Moberg skittered forward and patted Janner's pockets. Fool, if it's true you have these fruits, I'll tell the overseer and we'll search the factory until they're found. Then you'll be thrown into the box again. You don't want that, do you? The Ridge Runner smiled wickedly. I heard you in there crying and crying. It was pathetic. Janner ignored him. It's true you might find the apples, but trust me when I say I've hidden them well. It may take you days and days to find them, and by then, the longer they sit, Moberg's face fell, the worser they get. Just as Janner hoped, the Ridge Runner couldn't bear the thought of letting perfectly sweet apples go to rot. How many did you say? Two? Two sweet, shiny red apples. Moberg bit into the apple in his hand. He closed his eyes and chewed in ecstatic silence. Very well. If I do this favor for you, you will tell me the location of the apples? Once you prove to me that the favor is done, and if you swear by the fruit of the green hollows and the holes in the mountains that you'll not betray me, I'll tell you where to find the apples. The hollows? The holes? Mobrick gasped. How do you know such things? I just know. You have my word that I'll give you the apples if you swear on the hollows and the holes that you'll do as I ask. I can't help you escape if that's what you want. That's not it. I want you to do something for another of the tools. Mobrick cocked his head and thought for a moment. Fine. What do you want? Hurry or the apples will worsen. Janner had eaten two bowls of broth the night after his conversation with Sarah Cobbler, knowing he'd be stuck in the box for three days. After the third shift, when he was easing his tired bones into bed, the Ridge Runner appeared again. It's done, boy! Starting when? Tomorrow, first shift! You swear on the hollows and the holes? Mobrick straightened and adjusted his coat, offended that his honor was in question. I swear it, on the fruit of the green hollows and the holes in the mountains! Thank you, Mobrick. Where are the apples? He demanded. What apples? Mobrick looked so shocked he might faint. I'm just kidding, Janner said. They're right over there, under the pillow in that empty bunk. The Ridge Runner darted to the bunk and removed the apples. He held them before his head in triumph, then shoved an apple against each nostril and inhaled deeply. 
Janner had smiled as Moberg skipped away, even though he knew the box awaited him. This would be his last time in a bunk for a long time, if everything went according to plan. He was determined to enjoy it. That was days ago, as far as Janner could guess. Now, in the darkness of the box, his back ached. He wanted to turn on his side, but there wasn't room. He had thought that his first time in the box would make this time easier. It made the beginning easier because he didn't have to pass through the dreadful experience of discovering he was trapped, but knowing he had to endure three days instead of two was maddening. Janner's stomach growled again, and he thought about the last apple. He had taken four from the basket, lost one to Mobrick at the beginning, then given him two in exchange for the favor. He hid the last one in his big glove until his second dash through the factory. He had waited until he found Sarah Cobbler at lunch, and she confirmed that Mobrick had indeed kept his word. As soon as Janner returned to the pairing station, he steeled himself for another run. He dropped his giant scissors, slipped the apple into his pocket, waited until the maintenance managers were looking elsewhere, and bolted. This time, he zipped through the aisles toward the staircase with ease. In fact, he worried for a moment that his escape was going too well. He heard none of the cries of alarm this time, no signs of pursuit from the managers. He bounded up the steps, a little frustrated, because this time he wanted to get caught. Then he ran into someone, someone bigger than a child, someone wearing a ridiculous top hat. Good another escape attempt, child, the overseer said with an evil grin. Janner shrugged and smiled. The overseer pushed Janner to the ground and uncoiled his whip. You'll not be smiling for long. The worst part about being stuck in the coffin this time was that he had no way to tend to his wounds. Welts covered his arms, his back, and his thighs. The overseer had whipped him until Janner begged him to stop. Even the maintenance managers looked away, probably because it reminded them of their own beatings from the same whip. Pick him up, the overseer ordered. Three days in the box. So Janner lay in the dark thinking again of his family, of his wounds, of Tink, wherever he was. He thought of the clean snow of the ice prairies, the welcome arms of Gammon's people. His stomach growled, and he decided it was time to eat the apple. It was gone far too soon, but at least it was moist enough to slake his thirst, and it quieted the hunger pains for a while. He slept in fits. He descended into a numb trance in which his memories swirled before his eyes like smoke. Every sour thought he'd ever thought, every cruel word he'd ever said to his brother or sister, every selfish action he'd ever taken, rose out of the darkness like ghosts and taunted him. He replayed arguments, wishing he'd said some things, wishing he hadn't said others. He was trapped in a place where all he had was himself, and though he'd never thought of himself as a bad person, every motive, thought, and action that paraded through the blackness told him otherwise. Even his alliance with Sarah Cobbler was driven by selfishness. It was true he hoped to help her escape, that he wanted badly for her to be free. But would he be willing to set her free if it meant he had to stay? He was ashamed of the answer. All his justifications, that he was a throne warden, that he had to keep Tink safe, that somehow he and his brother and sister might help keep the dream of Anaria alive, all of it was meaningless if he thought himself somehow worthier of being set free than any of the children in the factory, especially pretty Sarah Cobbler. After the third long day, the door to the coffin at last swung open. As before, the light stung Janner's eyes. He groaned and climbed from the coffin stiffly. Out, Flavogel! I see you were able to find fruit even in the box, Mobrick said when he saw the browned apple core in the coffin. He's a sneaky boy, he is. Come on, the overseer wants to speak to you. Janner, though he was weary to the bone, though his body was bruised from the whip, though he was hungry and thirsty and covered with filth, grinned. He couldn't wait to visit the overseer. The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson Book Two North or be eaten. Chapter 44. Mountains and Shackles. Janner climbed the steps from the dungeon slowly, willing his stiff legs to work. He would need them very soon. Just like last time, Mobrick led him into the big, empty room where the carriage sat. 
No sunlight shone through the high windows, which meant it was nighttime. Perfect. As long as Mobrick hadn't changed the schedule, things were lining up exactly as Janner had hoped they would. In the center of the room, the sad brown horse was harnessed to the carriage, just as before, except that it faced the portcullis, as if the overseer were preparing to leave, perhaps on one of his trips to Tilling Court to pick up more kidnapped children. Janner's mind buzzed, but he was too tired, too stiff to sort out whether or not his unexpected change would affect his escape. Before he could worry about it anymore, Mobrick pushed Janner through the door to the overseer's office. The overseer sat at his desk, a ledger open before him. The top hat, to Janner's surprise, wasn't on his head, but on a hook beside the door. The whip dangled from a hook beside the hat. Eyes on me, tool. Janner nodded, trying to appear more exhausted than he really was. He wanted the overseer and Mobrick to believe he was finally beaten. No, it has come to my attention that you are a resourceful tool. Mobrick here informed me that you were able to locate three apples. Four, sir, said Mobrick, holding up the apple core from the coffin. Janner's heart pounded. He felt certain that somehow they had found him out. He bowed his head and closed his eyes, praying Sarah Cobbler hadn't been punished. Four, said the overseer. So, you managed to carry food into the box with you. As I said, resourceful. Would you agree, Mobrick? Yes, sir. Now, Tool, it's obvious you managed to outwit Mobrick here. You took the apples from his fruit basket when he wasn't looking and saved them for later snacks. Mobrick told me he caught you trying to eat them in your bunk. That's right, sir, the Ridge Runner said with a nervous glance at Janner. Got the Tool crunching away in his bed. I snatched the apples and ate them myself. Couldn't let them go rotten, sir. You know what they say. The longer they sit, the worser they get. The overseer raised an eyebrow and hope flickered in Janner's heart. The Ridge Runner had lied about the apples. Maybe that meant he had kept Sarah's transfer a secret after all. Maybe the Ridge Runner had indeed honored his oath. Yes, we know you're very passionate about fruit, Mobrick. Thank you. Now shut your mouth. The overseer turned his attention to Janner again. So I propose to you, Tool, that you accept a probationary promotion to the rank of apprentice maintenance manager. And keep my eyes open for the resourceful boys and girls. You would no longer be forced to pair the blades. You would be given certain freedoms. A new bunk, for instance. Nothing too hard, so hard and lumpy as the one you're in. And in time, you would work shorter hours, as long as you performed your function well. Janner tried to look grateful. Best of all, you'll get bread with your broth. How would that sound? Janner nodded again, suddenly unsure of himself. The thought of a softer bed, bread with his meal, and most of all, never having to lift the metal shears again made him hesitate. Was he acting too soon? He'd only been in the factory for a week, and already he was being promoted. If he stayed longer, maybe he would discover other opportunities to escape, opportunities that weren't so risky. After all, if his current plan didn't work, he'd be whipped and thrown in the box again. He gulped. Four days in the box with no food or water, no light, no room to move, and this time without even the apple to sustain him. It would be too much to bear. Very well, the overseer said. Finish your current shift at the pairing station, and tomorrow we'll assign you a managerial trainer. What about Gimbleton, Mobrick? Yes, sir said Mobrick, who had been nibbling at the last bits of apple on the core. I said, do you think Gimbleton would be a good trainer for our tool here? Aye, sir, Gimbleton's resourceful too, and mean. The tool's already met him. Remember the boy you met the first day here? The one with the chain? Janna remembered, and the thought of working with that rotten boy made him sick. He didn't want to learn anything from Gimbleton or Mobrick or the overseer. He wanted to find his family. The overseer stood and closed his ledger. Escort the tool to his station, Mobrick. Then come back quickly. We're off to Tilling Court again. The overseer removed his hat and whipped from the wall. Word has come that the bereaved there collected more tools for exchange. And Mobrick... Sir? Do keep an eye on your fruit this time. The tool here is a sneaky one. 
Mobrick bowed and pushed Janner out of the office behind the overseer. I'd like you to drive tonight, Mubrick. I'll be in the carriage, the overseer said as he crossed the large room with his hat and whip in hand. Mobrick prodded Janner toward the double doors that led to the factory. The moment had come. Janner had to decide. Either keep quiet, obey the overseer, and learn to become a maintenance manager, or run like mad and pray that young Sarah Cobbler was as brave as her eyes were beautiful. But he hadn't counted on the overseer leaving. He was supposed to stay at his desk in the office like last time. Janner's heart thudded like a galloping horse. If anything went wrong, it would be the coffin again, and not just for him, but for Sarah Cobbler, too. He couldn't do it. Even if he was willing to endure the box again, he couldn't bear the thought of Sarah in the coffin, all because of his foolish, hasty plan to escape. As he approached the double doors, he clenched his fists and his jaw with frustration. He hated the thought, but maybe it would be best to bide his time as a maintenance manager, learn the ways of the factory better in order to find its weak spots. Then he would find a way out that didn't put Sarah at risk. Of course, he would have to treat the children with as much cruelty as the other managers or they would demote him to the pairing station again. Janner looked at his hands. The blisters had healed and left knotty, leathery calluses on his palms and fingers. They reminded him of Poto's hands, and Janner stopped in his tracks. At the thought of his grandfather, some hidden, reckless strength that ran in Janner's blood came alive and crackled like lightning. Energy flamed in his joints and strengthened his bones. If Mobrick had been watching Janner instead of the floor, he would have seen the boy grow two inches before his eyes. In his mind's eye, Janner sensed a swirl of color and heat that spun like a water mill for a moment and then settled into an image. He saw his sister, as real as the double doors in front of him. Lily sat in a bright place, surrounded by snowy mountains, holding her whistle harp to her lips. Janner saw blurry figures in the background, but couldn't be sure who they were. Then one of the figures limped past, unmistakably Poto wrapped in furs. But where was Tink? The image swirled again and made him so dizzy that he staggered. As if from far away, he heard Mulbrick say, What's wrong, too long, too long in the box this time? The image settled again, this time on Tink's face. He looked afraid. His eyes were bruised and swollen. Where is he? Janner thought. As if an answer, the image widened and he saw that his brother was in a cage. Shackles bound his ankles and wrists, and in the hazy edges of the image, Janner saw several figures, so dirty and muddy that they could only be stranders. The nearest of them bent over the cage and spoke to Tink. Janner couldn't hear the voice, but he knew before the strander in the image turned that it was Claxton Weaver. The image swirled again and was gone as fast as it had come. Janner blinked and shook his head, trying to make sense of what he had just seen. He felt a rush of emotion, exhilaration at the sight of his sister on the icy peak and fear for Tink in the cage. But was this something happening now? Was this just a dream or another vision like the one Lily had caused at the cliffs when the sea dragons had spoken? It didn't matter. All uncertainty was gone. Janner felt as though he could burst through the portcullis with his bare hands and run all the way to the burrow as fast as a horse. Duo! Mobrick yelled. What? Sorry, Janner stammered, pretending to still be dizzy. What's the matter? called the overseer. Janner turned to see him leaning out the carriage door, hat in hand. The duo stopped walking, sir! Nearly fell over! said the ridge runner over his shoulder. Do you need the sting of the whip to wake you, Tool? The overseer called. Janner shook his head. Then hurry up! The hour grows late, Mobrick. The overseer disappeared into the carriage again. Janner pushed through the double doors and into the long, dark corridor to the factory floor. Mobrick prodded Janner on the back again and again, eager to turn him over to the maintenance managers and return to the carriage where the overseer waited. But halfway down the dark corridor, Janner stopped. If there had been more light, Mobrick would have seen that Janner's eyes were as fiery as the windows in the near distance. He would have seen that his fists were clenched and his jaw was set. In fact, the little ridge runner probably would have run. Janner grabbed Mobrick by the shirt collar. He lifted the little creature and pinned him against the wall, clamping a hand over his mouth before he had time to scream for help. Janner leaned close. I don't intend to stay here another moment, ridge runner. 
There's much to do and far to go. Now, I'm glad you kept your oath by the holes in the hollows, and I'm offering you another chance to do your race proud. Mobrick's eyes widened. Good, Tanner thought. He has reason to be afraid. Strength, like cool wind, flowed through him, as if he were more than a twelve-year-old boy, or was being made into more than one, with every surge of the royal blood in his veins. If you swear to keep quiet and give me time to escape, then we'll leave it at that. I think you'd rather the overseer didn't make you wear that ridiculous suit or order you about like he does. I think you wish you were still in the Kilridge Mountains, trying with your kinsmen to outwit the Hollows folk of their fruit. Am I right? Then you remember what it was like before Nag and his fangs upset everything. If I can't get out of here, there's a chance. If I can get out of here, there's a chance that, that things can go back to the way they were. You and your people can go home. Do you understand? Janner hardly understood himself, but Mobrick nodded. So are you going to keep quiet? I just need ten minutes. Can you give me that? Mobrick nodded again. Good. No, I'm going to let you go. Stay here in the corridor for ten minutes, and the overseer won't know you helped me. Tell him, tell him I punched you and left you unconscious or something. Mobrick nodded again. Janna released Mobrick's mouth, though he kept his fist balled and ready to strike should the little man try to raise an alarm. Instead, Mobrick asked, Who are you? Janner took a deep breath. My name is Janner Wingfeather, Throne Warden of Anaria. Mobrick gasped. You're one of the jewels! That's right. Now swear it by the holes in the hollows. Certainly, child. I have no love for Nag or the Overseer. Go and do whatever it is that's so important. Janner studied the little man's shadowy face. He would have to trust him. All right, ten minutes, then sound whatever alarm you wish. I'll be long gone. Janner released him. So suddenly that it took Janner a moment to understand what was happening, the Ridge Runner dashed toward the doors that led to the carriage, screaming at the top of his lungs. 